Good morning to each of you. Uh, I, um, I appreciate that uh, introduction, Aaron. I, interestingly enough, um, I'm going to be sharing about how some of that comes together today, uh, especially like the supernatural and the Father's heart. And so, um, uh, but I want you to know that I'm, that I'm, I'm like a normal guy. I, but, but, uh, but I believe some things different than most people. That's what makes the difference. And so I, I know when I was uh, learning about people who God moved through their lives through miracles and, and uh, salvations and deliverance and casting out demons and stuff, I was like, what, what are they doing different? Like, I'd like to see that in my own life. Well, like, what are they doing different? And I learned it wasn't so much about, about what we're doing to earn the privilege of being used by God in that. It, it just really boils down to coming back to the scripture and really unlearning some stuff and believing what it said right there. And then that shifts your whole view of, of who God is and who Christ is and the Holy Spirit and your identity and all these things. And then stuff starts happening, and that's pretty cool. Um, I, and, and so looking at this, this series, um, Honey in a Rock, and listening to some of the messages that have been shared over the past few weeks about how do you abide in the wilderness? Like when you're in that wilderness time, like what do you do? How do you stay focused? And uh, a lot of really good, if you haven't, if you missed some of those, I encourage you to go back and just look at the different perspectives on, on that from the different speakers who have shared. And uh, it's just been really cool. I, I want to share with you um, a couple of seasons in my life where I was in a literal wilderness in a literal desert. Um, some of you know I was a, a chaplain in the, in the United States Air Force, and so they, they paid for a few of my mission trips. <laughs> oh, it's, it's the only perspective. <laughs> they, they paid for, uh, I took a mission trip to Iraq, uh, when things were pretty exciting. Um, and then a few years later, I took another mission trip to Afghanistan. And both of those locations, I assure you, qualify <laughs> as desert and wilderness. <laughs> and so I've been th thinking about like, okay, how could I encourage the rock on how to have a perspective on honey in the rock and how to find honey in the rock and how, what to do and, you know, there are like questions to ask, uh, uh, things like that. And, I, and, I, and the Holy Spirit reminded me, he's like, no, let me just, you should, you should share with them about those times where you found honey from a rock. So, in addition to talking about what to do and to, to discover it or things like that, I, I want to just share um, what it looked like in my life on a couple of occasions to be in the wilderness and to experience God bringing honey out of a rock. Now, we've talked about this whole idea of honey in a rock, like honey is... It's like it's the supernatural provision and the goodness of God that comes out of a time or out of a period, out of a season, or it doesn't seem logically possible. It doesn't seem naturally possible for there to be honey that comes out of a rock. And we've been focusing on this passage from, from Psalms um, where, where, God's talking, talk, where God's talking to his people saying, listen, uh, I wanted to do these things for you guys, and, and this is the things I would have done. I would have protected you from your enemies. I would have done all these kind of things. And 
if you had listened, like if you were obedient, if you, if you don't bow down to foreign gods and, and, and idol worship and all that kind of stuff, then I would have brought honey out of a rock. And if we pass the microphone around this auditorium, we can hear multiple stories of what that looked like. Like we've, we've experienced that before. Um, and so I wanna share a couple, of, a couple of things that come from these, these two seasons. In, in 2007, there was, uh, we were in the real, the heat of the Iraq war. And, um, and even though, because we had a lot of people who were dying, American troops, Iraqis, Iraqis who were on our side, the Iraqis who were not, um, there was a lot of stuff happening, y'all. So when I got my orders saying that you are going to go to Iraq, I thought to myself, huh, there's a bunch of people that could have been picked to go in my place. But God is sending me to Iraq. So I had to view it as a, a mission trip. Like why, would he, why would he send me? Why would that be important for me to go? And the answer to that goes back into the things I knew about God, the things I had seen God do. Um, and I thought perhaps it is this idea of God being a father, is this idea of uh, our role of children, as children of God advancing the kingdom of God. Perhaps that's something that God wants to bring to Iraq. All right, well then we're gonna see how this is gonna go. We're gonna see what is going to happen. And so I was a hospital chaplain uh, and because of my hospital training, they sent me over there. Not a lot of chaplains at the time had hospital ministry training and, and I did. And so because of that, when they sent me to Iraq, they assigned me to a hospital. And, uh, and when I got to the hospital, uh, on the very third day there in Iraq, it was the worst day to this day of my life. On the third day, uh, the chaplain who I was replacing, as a matter of fact, when you arrive and you're replacing someone, you are that person's very best friend. <laughs> they have been waiting so long to see you. <laughs> So there's a few days of overlap where you kind of, they help you get your feet wet and understand that this was, this is was here and this is, you know, all this kind of stuff. So on the third day, um, I get this call and we're in this huge tent. If you imagine like mash, except like instead of green tents, it's like tan to match the desert. Um, and we're in this tent and, uh, and I, the call comes over the, uh, over the, uh, the, the intercom, chaplain to the ICU, chaplain to the ICU. So I'm like, this is not good. This is the ICU. Like, right? People, people aren't in in in, in war. Uh, people don't have cancer in the hospital. In in the war, people aren't there because of high blood pressure. In the hospital, something happened. So everybody in the ICU is jacked up pretty bad. So I get to the ICU, and uh, actually, this is the ER. I'm sorry. I get to the emergency room. Get to the emergency room. And there is a man on the gurney, and, and the, the story is his Humvee had hit an IED, an improvised explosive device, homemade roadside bomb. And uh, his Humvee had hit the IED, rolled over it, and he was the gunner at the top. And he flew 200 yards out of there. They said he was a human fireball. To give you an idea, that's... That's two football fields that he flew. As I'm looking at his body on this gurney, his body looks exactly like this, this color, head to toe. He looks like a human piece of a charcoal. And the crazy thing about this whole dynamic is his vitals were as strong as yours and mine. They could not give him morphine because the needles couldn't get through his skin. 
Chaplain, we need you, and you need me to what? <laughs> There's nothing else we can do for him. So then they moved him to palliative care, and everyone's standing around like, this is a, this is a young dude, man. I mean, none of us had seen anything like this. This is my third day. I've got four more months to go. And um, I, I, I went to my, my office with my chaplain assistant, and uh, I sat down there and I cried. I had all these people in this other room, they're like waiting for the chaplain to do something. Like, Hold on. <laughs> Wait a minute. I sat down and I cried, and I said, God, what do you want me to do? And he gave me what to do. So I got a hymnal, I got my chaplain assistant to run some copies off of a page of a song called Amazing Grace. We all stood around this, this, this bed and I said, listen guys, um, I think we need to sing Amazing Grace. And I don't know everybody's faith background, but you're welcome to join us or not. I've got the page the words if you don't know the words. And so we all began to sing Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. And we're singing, we're choking back tears, and we're crying. And we got to verse, verse 3. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. And he was gone. It's like, God, I don't know what else we can do for this guy, but what, what can we do to help him go home? And that was the answer to sing Amazing Grace. And in a few moments, he was gone. I went back to my office and I said, you know what, um, God, I was pretty filled with a lot of confidence and faith when I got over here. This is day three. I've got 130 more days to go. I'm ready to go home now. I can't, I can't do this without something happening to me. <laughs> if, this, if this keeps on happening, I'm, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I'm going to make it. Like, I can't. I can't deal with this. So when you think about wilderness experiences and desert experiences and where your, your faith gets challenged and your faith gets weak or you're wondering where God's at or all this kind of stuff, let me tell you, I was on day three of 133. And I was like, I don't, I, I've got a lot of questions right now. But it was in this season of my life that because it was going to be harder than anything else. I knew I was going to need to know him more than any other time in my life. Because I, I, was, I wasn't going to be able to go to the Air Force and say, hey, guys, listen, uh, yeah, this is not working out. <laughs> we, we've got, a, you know, we gave it a shot. We gave it a shot. I need to go home. I wasn't going to be able to do that. I was there. Like, there's no getting out. I was there. I'm in it, Right? When you're in those wilderness experiences, like if you could get out, you'd get out. But you can't. And because you can't, because there are so many things outside of your control, you got to focus on the things that are in your control. Like I could not turn the war off. There were bombs coming in, rocket-propelled grenades. Our enemy Iraqis, as opposed to our friendly Iraqis, because there were a bunch who were really... You know, good, solid people, glad that we're there to help. But they would drive down these roads on these pickup trucks, drive down, get out, and shoot a rocket-propelled grenade, hop in a truck, and then, and then keep on going. Because they knew if they stayed there too long, we were going to get them. And when we did, they ended up in the hospital. We ended up treating them. That's a whole other side of that whole thing. And so I knew in this moment... 
I couldn't get out. I couldn't change the war. I couldn't turn it off. What was in my control? My relationship with God was in my control. My ability to be aware of him and that, uh, enlarging my awareness of him in that moment was in my control. And let me tell you something. When you're in a place for 133 days and you get bombed 183 times, there are distractions from the presence of God. When you're walking, because it's lunchtime, and you're walking outside and boom, now you got to run to a shelter. Those are, can be distractions from the presence of God. When a mortar lands across the street, for when you're out there walking around, no armor on it, across the street, there, are, there can be distractions from the presence of God. When people are bringing in wounded all the time, legs off, this and that, all kind of things happening, there can be a lot of things that distract you from the presence of God. No one else was going to help me press into his presence. I had to make up my mind that in the midst of everything going on, in the midst of the conditions of the desert, the conditions of the wilderness, I know enough about God to know I need him more now than any other time in my life. And it's my responsibility. My responsibility to make the time to be with him because he was going to be the only way I was going to make it out with, a, with my sanity. And so it was in this area, it was in this time where mortars and, and we, we could, I could be in the middle of the night and we had this thing called the, um, um, the, the, the Claxton gun. Like if a mortar came shooting over, the Claxton would go and try to shoot it down so it wouldn't land on us. So you could wake up in the middle of the night, you know, you just have a nice little dream of being, I don't know, in America. <laughs> wakes, that, that's what wakes you up. Or here, boom, boom, boom. And the next thing here is choppers going to get whoever shot that. That was my life for a while. That was my mission trip. No one else could do it for me. I had to press in. When I say press in, that means intentionally focusing on him in the midst of all these other things that were not stopping. All the things that I was seeing in the number one trauma center in the world at that time, the Air Force Theater Hospital in Balad, Iraq, number one trauma center in the world, not Baltimore, not LA, no, right there. And I was a chaplain doing 12-hour shifts during the day. Another one did 12-hour shifts during the night. And then we rotated uh, mi midway. Nothing else. Y'all listen, nothing else could help me. It was in this time, this wilderness, this desert, that's when I really learned how to worship. That's where. I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't learn it from Fire and Flame Conference. <laughs> no, I had no fire and flames over there. No, it wasn't no fire and flames. It was bullets and bombs and people dying every day. And it's in the midst of that kind of place that I was like, I need to really learn how to worship. Like, because what I came over here with, it's not going to last. The way I did it, it's not going to, no, I need, to, I, need, I need him for real. And so I would start, there were some things I had on my, on my, uh, um, my iPod. <laughs> you remember those? <laughs> some songs I would put on my iPod and I'm listening. So I listened to a song or two, you know, laying in bed before I got up to go to work. And it, and it gradually increased from a song or two to two hours before I went to work. And I will just lay there. I wasn't jumping them down when no, I was just laying there and just worship, just worship. And so the, the, the God consciousness that developed in that time is what helped me before my 12 hour shifts of having a peace, listen, that surpasses all understanding. It makes no sense, but it's there. You can't comprehend it, but it's real. Surpasses all understanding. 
And sometimes I would have dreams um, of, it was just really weird. Like one time I had, I had a dream, I won't go into details, but I had a particular dream. And in this dream, I saw this patient. I said, these, he had this condition. I, saw, I said these words and some things happened. I'm like, that's weird. I went to work and guess what? There was that patient. I didn't have to ask, what should I say? He already told me. God awareness, God consciousness in a war zone helped me. When there was stuff all over the ER floor that I volunteered to help clean up, more blood, brains, all that kind of stuff, it was a lot. God, it was my responsibility. See, when you can't turn off all the other stuff, you better focus on what you can turn on. That's your own pressing in, your intentionality of going to be there. I knew I needed to be there with him. I needed to be there before uh, my shift and, uh, and after my shift. I needed to go right, right back to that place. That's where I learned how to worship, listen, in spirit and in truth. That's where I learned even if my body was still, my spirit could be jumping around. Like it's just, I learned about this connection. He is a spirit, right? Those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. That means as a spirit, he put inside of you a spirit. That's what comes alive when you come alive to God in Christ, that it's your spirit. And you can connect with him. And even if your body is completely still, your spirit and his spirit can be having this whole dance together, this whole connection and unity. And, and, and what ends up happening is, is that this connection and what he is pouring into you and the exchanges that he's making when he's taking out fear and putting in faith and, and he's, he's bringing strength and perseverance and all of these things that come from his nature and his personality, he's putting in you and some kind Kind of way. I can't explain it because it's spiritual. He flushes the soul of all those other things that don't belong there when you make the time to lay on the operating table and he will do what he needs to do. And, 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 and the, the crazy thing about it is then when you're in these life situations, like real life situations, you have something, you have a deep well in your spirit to draw from that takes control over your mind so that you can handle stuff with a peace that surpasses all understanding, where you can handle things with supernatural wisdom and supernatural knowledge while everything else is going around you, that, that, that's chaos. You have come from a place of peace and now you can actually bring it. You, you, listen, you can't just be declaring peace in the midst of a storm where you don't know nothing about God's peace. You, you, you've got to be able to experience it like it's got it's, it has to be deposited you have to receive it from him and sometimes you got to make it your business to, to go and just be connected with it to unite with it to have it and so when, when Christians tell me that they're going through hell and high water and all this kind of stuff and they don't have time to pray I'm like you, you don't want to win you, you, you'd rather you'd rather complain the hour you spent complaining to me you could have been in your closet you don't want to win you would rather complain because that uh, uh, teases your flesh and satisfies your flesh instead of being in the prayer closet with God where your spirit can get fed, where your spirit can be built up, where your inner man can be strong enough for you to not be having this conversation with me, but to be handling business and taking, taking ground for the kingdom. That, that's what you should be doing. That there's a whole different way of living that you and I are invited into because of our position in Jesus Christ and all the things that he has given to us. I, I remember there was, um, uh, <clears throat> when I was in Iraq and all this was happening, things began to shift. I thought, okay, all right, God is, God is here. This, this, I, I got stories for days, like he was saying. Um, I remember one time this young man uh, who had a, a, was from a particular denomination, he was a minister, particular denomination that did not believe that, that Christians can be impacted by evil spirits. I said, okay, I'm not, I'm not you know, going to argue with you. But in, the, in this whole conversation, he was sharing some stuff that I discerned was an attack by evil spirits. <laughs> but he didn't believe in it. I said, okay, it's no problem. I'm not, I'm not going to argue with you. But any time that you want prayer to work on this, these issues you're talking about, just let me know. So he decided to set up a meeting. I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> come on in, right? <laughs> So it didn't take long. He's sitting in a chair. I'm sitting in the chair. And as we're, as we're praying, he starts convulsing and falling on the floor and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, and then he kind of he comes to, he's like, how did I get down here? It's like, hmm, have I got a story for you? 
and so, so these evil spirits were, were coming out of him. Christian, minister, the whole deal. Like, I don't have time to argue with folks. Christian can have demons. Okay. I have to prove to you. Okay. Like, I know too much. I see too much. I don't even, it's not even a thing for me. Okay. But anytime you want prayer, you let me know. <laughs> yeah. And so I was, there was a moment where I was like in my flesh. And, uh, and so he was like, well, how did I get down here? I, was like, well, I got a story to tell you whenever you want to listen, but I would prefer you to get in your chair. And if you want to do that. <laughs> what, what, what happened? I, he said, listen, I heard myself growling. I heard it too. Yeah. Y'all listen, this is way before we're carrying iPhones around to record everything. I was like, man, man, you should have seen yourself. <laughs> so I was in my flesh. I said, I thought you said, Christian, are you saved? Well, yeah, you love Jesus? Well, how did that thing get in there? <laughs> so we, we had wrapped up, it was like one o'clock in the morning. We had wrapped up this whole ministry time and, uh, and he ended up speaking in tongues, by the way which he didn't believe was possible. <laughs> Whoop, there it is. <laughs> and so, so I, I was wrapping up with him. And so there's, there's a, a knock on the, the chapel door. Like it's one o'clock, one or two o'clock in the morning. And uh, uh, so the, the office is not supposed to be open. I mean, we're all supposed to be asleep. Knock on the door, opens up. There's, a, there's this guy. He's probably like, like this tall. And... Uh, and he's like, I need help. Well, I'm all warmed up. Um, come on, come on in. And so he comes in and he's like, uh, he's like, I just need help. Uh, what kind of help do you need? He starts breathing. He sounds like a bull. He, I'm like, oh, you need that kind of help. Like, all right. I said, well, what brought you here? I heard a voice tell me that I could come and that it would be open. Now, what that tells me is God's already involved in what's about to happen, right? Okay. I said, now, I'm, I'm already, I've been with this other guy for a few hours. I'm kind of tired, but I'm ready to rock and roll. And so, uh, long story short, he was telling me some things happening with him, and I put my hand on his head, and I commanded rage and anger and stuff to leave. <laughs> Here's the craziest thing, right? He, so he's like, all this, this rough, rough and tough and every, everything he's saying is, yeah, right? And so I put my hand on, I said, you want to be free? He's like, yeah, that's why so I came here. Okay, so I put my hand on his head and I prayed probably just a few seconds, like see the spirits leave and all that kind of stuff. And he goes, <clears throat> he goes, man, you know, God's called me into youth ministry and blah, blah, blah. What the, who are you? You think you want to respond to that call now? Yeah, I think I'm ready. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I bet you are. When you think about honey from a rock, we're talking about miracles that come out of places where you don't really expect them. Tell my God to do some supernatural things in these dry seasons of our lives. Y'all, the war was still going on and demons were being cast out. The war was still going on and people were still being healed. Basically, my, my office in the, uh, in the tent was, uh, was next door to the uh, occupational therapy. You see where I'm going with this. So people come down and uh, sometimes they're just friends. Sometimes they just didn't even, they didn't have a clue what was, you know, what, how I roll. So they come down and say, hey, Chad, how are you doing? Like, yeah, I'm, I'm doing good. What, what, what brings you to the hospital? Well, I got an appointment over here at the such and such. Oh, what, what's, what's, what's bothering you? Well, I got this thing on my ankle or a thing on my knee. Or, okay, you want to pray for you? Okay, yeah. So then, you know, they naked healed and then they leave. And so um, I was talking to a friend of mine who is the occupational therapist and uh, just telling about all these amazing things happening. She's like, that's why people are canceling their appointments. <laughs> <sighs> Sorry to waste your time. Uh, people were canceling their appointments. I remember it was Easter, 2007. It was Easter. This is just Iraq. I haven't got to Afghanistan yet. The, 
it, it, it was Easter, and I was talking about the power of the resurrection, right? Appropriate on Easter. And uh, we just had this uh, really cool Easter sunrise service. You know, uh, the sun comes over these mountains and stuff. It's pretty, pretty cool there in, uh, in Iraq. And so I was talking about the power of the resurrection, this and that. And so this guy had come in on these crutches, and his, his foot, he's, he was in uniform, but his foot was he had no stock, no shoe, just his foot was bare. And he had these, these pin drawings all over his foot. And so, uh, so I was curious. I said, what's going on with your foot? He's like, man, something bit me. Like one of, one of these Iraqi bugs that bit me, and I had a, you know, allergic reaction to it. And his foot had blown up. Like typically, you know, you got like your, your, your knuckles on your toes, and there's some wrinkles supposed to be in there, right? There were no wrinkles on his foot. Like completely smooth skin, his foot was swollen. And, uh, and it was sensitive to touch, so he didn't, want, he, did, he didn't touch it. He didn't want anyone to touch it. And so I, I was like, man, I just got to talk about just the resurrection power of, of Jesus. Uh, why don't we just why don't we pray for this guy? And so one, <laughs> the, the minister who didn't believe in demons, he, he was there. And so I, when I said, hey, mom, if we pray for you, the guy was like, yeah, let's pray for you. I'm like, yeah, you're a believer now, ain't you? But let's pray for you. So long story short, we prayed, and this is one of those times, this is one of early on when I was learning not to close your eyes, but I closed my eyes. And so we're praying for it, and no one touched his foot. I'm looking at it, it's like, this is crazy. So the drawings on there, were, the doctors were talking about where they, you know, had drawn where they're going to, it was kind of his prep for some kind of surgery or something. And so, uh, so people, people all gathered around, and we all, every one of us, closed our eyes. And so we, we prayed, um, man, it wasn't long, probably 15, 20, 20 seconds, just praying for the poison to be gone and all that kind of stuff. We opened our eyes and his foot was normal. Y'all, listen, like, okay, like it's one thing if someone says, oh, I have back pain and then my back pain is gone. Like, okay, that's cool. Like, but, but when you see a visible one, like you, when, like when you, like it, okay. <laughs> like, oh, it, like, like in seconds, it, like ice couldn't do that. Icy hot, can't, no. In seconds, his foot looked like from, went from a balloon to normal. We can see the wrinkles again in the, in the toe knuckles. To normal in seconds, we were blown away, blown away. And so he threw the crutches. I'm like, this is like the book of Acts kind of stuff. <laughs> He threw the crutches and started walking around on, on his foot. Like, y'all, he, he was ticked. Beforehand, he was like, it's all, you know, the real sensitive. Don't, don't touch it. He's walking around on He said, the glory of God is all over me. The glory of God is And we're all like, shut up. You got to be kidding me. Like, that's crazy. Like I, like, I saw it before and after. You're not, you're not, I'm, okay, what I had expected was to pray is to look the same and him come back tomorrow and say, look at my foot. That's what I expected. I didn't expect to open my eyes and it's, I'm, I'm, matter of fact, I asked one guy, I said, uh, does it, how, what is, how does it look to you? <laughs> I'm tripping. I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm seeing an open vision of what it's supposed to, I'm, I, y'all, I'm, <laughs> I, I, I wasn't ready. Okay, I wasn't ready. Man, you know how you, this a balance of like, you believe, but then you're not really ready. You know, you're not really ready for God to do it. Man, so he walked out, he left his crutches in the chapel. He walks out and he just, and he just, I was like, wow, wow. Here we are in a war zone, a rock. And we're finding some honey. We're finding some honey. It's God's power, it's his presence, it's his miracles, it's his goodness. And we're finding, we're finding some honey. I remember there was one person that had come through the ER, really, really bad shape. And for me to say about the Balad, Iraq, ER, this person's in bad shape, they're almost out of the game. And they were in such bad shape that they couldn't, um, uh, they couldn't stabilize the person to get them to an x-ray to find what's going on, get information to the surgeons so the surgeons can fix what's happening. So the entire team took this person into the x-ray area, like 
tubes and everything. Like, they don't normally do that, okay? The entire team, respiratory therapy, everyone is moved. And so I, there's, a, there's a little, you know, x-ray room, there's like a little box where the person sits to do the, you know? Like, they go back there where they're safe. Um, and so I was like, God, what do you want me to do? Like, what, I, I, what do you want me to do? He says, go in here and just shout Jesus. Like, that's it. I'm like, okay. Now, at this, here, here's the deal. At this point, I've learned, I don't care what it sounds like. You, you, like Mary told the people with the, with the water, do whatever he says. Okay, so I went in the corner. I'm literally in the corner of this room. All right, the little door was over here, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to stay on camera here. And so I'm, sitting, I'm just like, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And so they're like, we're losing him, we're losing him, we're losing him. Jesus, Jesus, we got him back. Amen. Okay, okay, this is awesome. So, but enough of Iraq, enough of Iraq. <laughs> Three years later, I'm sent to Afghanistan. Now, Afghanistan was a little different. In Iraq, people came in to the ER, quote, quote, unquote, unpackaged, straight from the field. Oftentimes, I would help the, the team get them off the chopper. I mean, they're straight from the field, okay? Saving Private Ryan. That. That's what I was looking at every day. That's what I was doing. Get them off. I saw them before they got to the doctor. So they were unpackaged. No bandages, no nothing. It was as they came from the point of injury, that's what I saw. We got to the ER. That's unpackaged, the bandages. In Afghanistan, it was a little different. When the troops came in, they came in packaged. So there was way less blood, all that kind of stuff. So they're already, already bandaged up. But nevertheless, there were still some interesting things happening over there. And so um, one situation, uh, one situation, uh, five, five guys had come in, and, and all of them were on the edge of, of dying based on what had happened. And I had been with a couple of guys. We had just got on, on shift. And um, so we got in there like, what's, what's going on? Well, this is what's going on. You know, we got this happening. And I had just been talking, and I'll share a bit more in a second, about what was happening in Afghanistan as far as the supernatural. So I just come, come on shift, and, uh, and they, they share what was happening. And I said, okay, is there a room where we can pray? They're like, well, the only empty room is that one right over there. Cool. So me and my, my other guys got in this other room, and we began to pray. And I said, um, I said, guys, listen, because they're kind of new to some of this stuff too. So we're going to close our eyes. We're going to pray. At this point, nothing is your imagination. You tell me every image that comes into your mind. You tell me every word that, and thought that comes into your mind. Because we're going to pray for these five guys and God's going to help us. And that's one way he's going to show us what to say and how to pray. Don't doubt anything because we ain't got time <laughs> we ain't got time for you to have four or five different confirmations about if this is the Lord or not right literally lives are on the line and so so we're praying and praying and praying and as we're praying I see this picture of like a I can only describe it as like a train of angels two by two like they're just like two after another, like two rows of them together, right? And like a train, like just coming down like that into the, into the emergency room, all right? Now, I'm like, that's interesting. But what I just got to tell these guys, there's no imagination up in here right now. No, no. So, okay, I said, guys, this is what I saw. We saw it. We all began to pray. Father, send the angels to come and to do this and to do that, and to, right? And so uh, I'm opening the door. Look at this. Yeah, how things going? Okay, let me get an update. I told a nurse, what's going on? How we doing? Well, we got something going on. But they're still close to the edge of dying. Okay, listen, hey, you ain't losing nobody today. Okay, I'll be right back. So we come back in here. And we're praying. So guys, they're still close to the edge. We're praying and praying and praying. Just for the sake of time, I'm just going to wrap it up. We're praying and praying. They didn't lose any. All five of them were stabilized. All five of them. But here's what's, here's what's crazy. While we were praying, one of them, I don't I can't. I can't remember if it was me or if it was another guy. I think it might have been another guy who said, um, said, I think they're overlooking something. Now, where did that kind of thought come from? Right? You don't just make that up. You, you think, oh, well, let, let's pray. So we're praying, God, let them see what they need to see. Let them find what they're overlooking. With the blah, 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 blah. Okay, long story short, the whole thing's over. Folks are stabilized. I'm talking to one of the doctors. And uh, how things go, man, yeah, that was kind of scary, man. They're on the edge, and then things start turning around, like with all five of them. That was crazy. Yeah, it was crazy. Huh? <laughs> he said, and, and so he goes, man, we were about done. That we couldn't find 
one of our, some kind of tool. They had left it in somebody. They opened it back up and got it. Lord, let them find whatever they need to find. There was, there was one Sunday, because I knew that um, some people didn't really understand the supernatural. Law. You know, in the military, people have all different backgrounds, different denominations, and all those kind of things. And so my chapel was in the hospital. So it was a small conference room, and so I had services in there. So the main chapel was led by an army chaplain. And when she, the army is there for like 12, 18 months, okay? We're there for like four or six months. And so um, they're like, you guys are just here for a short time. I'm like, well, you had the same choice we did, okay? Um, <laughs> all right, let's, let's stop the hating. Uh, you signed on the dotted line. I wasn't there. You made your own choice. So, so the army chapter, so she's going home for like what's called like a mid-tour, like middle of break, go home for a couple weeks, take a break. So she said, hey, can you come and speak at our, at our, our main chapel? Okay, cool. There's like 300 Air Force, Army, civilians, you know, in there. I'm like, okay, what am I going to talk about? I'm going to talk about the kingdom of God. So I had a two-week, two-part series. The first week, so I talked about the kingdom of God coming in word and in power, right? So the first week, I talked about the kingdom of God in word. So I highlighted the scriptures. We talked about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. Kind of shift people's idea of, like, it's not all about church. We're here to advance the kingdom of God. When people join the kingdom of God, they become the church, right? So there's that part. So then, so that, that, that was week one, the kingdom of God in word. I said, next week, I'm going to show you the kingdom of God in power. So next week came around, I'm praying, God, God, give me some, give me some words of knowledge. Words of knowledge are when God gives you like supernatural uh, ideas about, specifically for healing, about people's physical conditions. Okay? Like you don't know it. Nobody else told you. It's just a word of knowledge. So I came back the following Sunday, and I preached a message about the kingdom of God, not just in word only, but in power. 1 Corinthians 4.20, but in power. And so I'm going to show you uh, this, this, this power. But I, but I want you to understand something. Because I know I was where some of you are, where you didn't believe that God does miracles today. We're going, we're going to deal with that. You, you, or, or you believe that God does miracles, but only certain people are specifically gifted to do them, and other Christians can do that. We, we're, going, we're going to deal with that. Long story short, I shared five words of knowledge. I said, how many of you, uh, you have this, you have this? And so people came up with the different kinds of words of knowledge. One of them, I was like, somebody has a pain that goes from this shoulder to this shoulder, and like, it hurts when you do this. <laughs> hurts when you do this. Uh, the guy who came up, he had injured uh, his, <laughs> whatever these are, uh, while he was working out. And he goes, yeah, it hurts when I do this. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you're my guy. So, so five people came up. I said, okay, I got one. I want four more other people who have never prayed for anyone, but you want God to move through you supernaturally. Four of you, raise your hands. If you want to come up here, we're going to try it today. Four people raised their hands. I said, come on up. Right? Long story short, we prayed for all five. I had one, the other folks had one, and everybody got healed. And I said, now, we got to talk about that now, don't we? Right? So much for God only uses special people. This person never prayed for anybody else in, in their life. And, and God used them to, to heal. So there goes the idea that it's only special people. Matter of fact, all five of these folks got healed. Like, we're not making this up. There's no number at the bottom of the screen telling you to send me money. There's nothing. I'm not promising you a prayer cloth. This is right here, live in Afghanistan in a war zone. And God just did something that most of y'all don't even believe he will do. What are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with that? The kingdom of God comes not just word only, but in power. So that night, I started my school of supernatural ministry in Afghanistan. So people came, because I had a night shift. That was during the day. So people came at night, and I started teaching about different things, healing, the prophetic, miracles, dreams, all this kind of stuff. And so the class was designed to be from 8 to 9.30. 8 to 9.30. 9.30 comes, and I go, hey, guys, listen. I'm on the night shift. I'm here till 8 in the morning. I know some of y'all have been here all day, right? Been, you, you know, awake. Uh, so I'm willing to stop. If you want to stop, I can keep on going. One person said, chap, you don't know how hungry we are. Copy that. The class ended at 1 o'clock. Every week for five weeks. One time we had a worship night. This will be the last one. One time we had a worship night. And... Uh, 
We're singing all these different songs. As a matter of fact, that was near the time where the, the anthem came out from Planet Shakers, right? Um, 